All the way back in the fall months of 1989, the Atari Corporation dropped a bomb on the gaming world. At the time, the most powerful, compact game machine around, the Lynx. This incredible piece of kit had 16-bit graphics and a full color screen. 16-bit graphics were also seen in the Genesis and TurboGrafx-16, both of which were also brand new, but also huge machines. In the portable space, the Nintendo Game Boy, also released in the same time frame, paled in comparison, with a screen that only showed four shades of green. To have any kind of game on the go was impressive, but for a lot of us, once we saw the full-color future the Lynx promised, we never looked back. The birth of the Lynx goes back to 1987, when two designers of the Amiga computer, R.J. Michael and Dave Needle, joined publisher Epix to work under another Amiga designer, David Morse. The goal was to create the most powerful game machine possible, delivering not only a color screen, but 4,096 possible colors, with 16 on each scan line. The screen lit up so you wouldn't need to be directly under a source of light. The display was also kind of letterboxed. Not 16 by 9, but not square like a TV either. The graphics allowed for scaling sprites and pseudo 3D tricks most games on the TV in 1989 couldn't pull off. That display could also be flipped upside down for players who want to play left-handed. The sound chip was very impressive, allowing for clear, digitized speech in many games. Eight players could connect and play at the same time. Development of future games would be easy, as the same guys who made the Lynx knew the Amiga inside and out, allowing for games to be made on that computer. What the team of RJ, Dave, and David created, they called the Handy Game and began to shop it around meeting with Nintendo and Sega, who declined to pick it up, for obvious reasons we all know now. Atari eventually became the buyer and rebranded the machine the Lynx, in reference to its multiplayer capability of linking up, which also started the short-lived trend of Atari naming all their gaming hardware after cats. All that power Epix put into the Lynx did come at a price. It was expensive. The Lynx debuted with a price tag of $179, double that of the Game Boy, and almost as expensive as the Genesis. That set did come with California games and an AC adapter, though. The price was later cut to $149 for the Deluxe set, and just $99 for the Lynx only. Not only was the Lynx expensive, but all those advanced parts were difficult to make, with early units in short supply. In 1989, the Game Boy won the Christmas season over the Lynx, walking away. When Atari-developed games began to be released starting in 1990, some really high-quality titles hit the stores, many based on popular arcade games. The problem was that, compared to Nintendo, it just wasn't enough, and would never be enough. Third-party publishers skipped over the links, and if they left the Nintendo sphere at all, they went to the Sega Game Gear, which after Christmas 91, took the number two spot from Atari. To reduce costs even further, a new design was released, smaller and lighter, with the option of turning off the display while the game was still running, saving battery life, while the new design increased overall battery life from four hours up to five. Not to mention playing with headphones gave the player full stereo sound. You would actually be hard pressed to find awful games in the Lynx's library. Comparing them to games of today isn't fair, but considering what the machine could do and what games were back then, a lot of them were great and there were games with recognizable names. Double Dragon, Ninja Gaiden, Paperboy, and Pit Fighter were well known to outsiders, giving Atari some gravitas and showing that the library, however small, wasn't full of no-name games. In 1992, Atari finally put a real effort into the Lynx. Lynx commercials began appearing on TV again for the first time since 1989. Some of those ads promoted the newest Lynx game, based on the new blockbuster movie, Batman Returns and just like Super Mario and Sonic before it, was given away to new owners that Christmas season. All seemed well going into 1993, but Atari suddenly reversed course on the Lynx to put all of its efforts behind the 64-bit Jaguar. Atari released only seven games in 1993. Mail-order game distributor Telegames picked up the slack, issuing several titles that year, keeping things alive, though just barely. Atari released only two more games, both in 1995 and then pulled the plug on the Lynx, cutting the price to $49 and giving away multiple games with each unit sold, until all remaining stock was cleared out. Telegames released a handful of games after this, while enthusiasts would self-release titles after the age of Atari. 
The Lynx may not have had the successes that the Game Boy and Game Gear had, but sold somewhere north of 3 million units, and had 76 games released overall. It's worth noting that the Lynx was also sold in Japan from 1989 to 1991, and among classic game enthusiasts there, is still remembered, and held in high regard. And while we all remember the Atari portfolio making a cameo in Terminator 2, the Lynx did get some screen time in its heyday, being featured in the epic, early Fox TV show, Parker Lewis Can't Lose. Of course, if you had your swatches synchronized at 7.30 every Sunday, you already knew that. Life After the Lynx saw RJ and Dave team up once more to develop the 3DO interactive multiplayer, starting work on it right after handing the Lynx off to Atari. No one really knows what 3DO was supposed to mean, but since that, the Amiga, and Lynx were all made by the same guys, it might mean third development order. Who knows? The Lynx did have one more day in the sun when select Lynx games appeared in Atari 50, the anniversary celebration, released in 2022, making these games and many others from the Atari era playable on modern hardware for the first time since the 90s. And on a final note, the Lynx's legacy lives on in every portable game machine that came afterwards, except the Turbo Express. As the Game Gear, Wonderswan, PlayStation Portable, DS, Steam Deck, and everything in between adopted the horizontal layout designed all those years ago.